Welcome back, everyone. Please welcome our second panel today, BDS Defeat, Achieving Victory Against Delegitimization. As many of you know, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, otherwise known as BDS, seeks to isolate and destroy Israel. Given BDS's popularity worldwide, this panel seeks to explore BDS's financial and political effectiveness, as well as the legal means which Israel, its affiliates, and citizens can pursue to counter and recover from BDS. We see this issue as an important problem in the overall topic of law and war. It is simply one more tactic being used in the war against Israel. Richard, please roll the tape. Isolating Jews and boycotting their businesses is as old as time. Even if the names change, the tactics don't. Israel's enemies still see boycotts, sanctions, and divestments as a powerful weapon. What is the effect of BDS? Is it having any real impact or just creating a stigma? Do our enemies really believe they can weaken Israel this way? I'm pleased to introduce to you our moderator today for this panel, Ann Hertzberg. Ann Hertzberg is the legal advisor for NGO Monitor. Prior to joining NGO Monitor, she worked as an attorney in New York. Her areas of, re areas of research include business and human rights, international human rights law, the laws of armed conflict, universal jurisdiction, interna international fact-finding, NGOs, and the UN. She frequently participates in UN conferences and appears before UN bodies. She, she is the author of the widely cited NGO Lawfare, Exploitation of Courts in the Arab-Israeli Conflict. Ms. Hertzberg holds a BA degree from Oberlin College and a JD from Columbia University School of Law. Please welcome Anne Hertzberg. Thank you, Rachel, and I just want to acknowledge the amazing job you've been doing uh, hosting this conference. Good job. So I'm pleased to welcome you to our panel on BDS today. We've been hearing the past two days about military challenges facing Israel, and now we're going to turn to political warfare. Um, we've heard a lot about asymmetrical warfare and how international law is exploited in various international institutions. We've heard about the Goldstone Report, the 2004 ICJ opinion against Israel's security barrier, the atrocious COI report on the Gaza riots that just came out of the UN Human Rights Council. And what the BDS movement does is they take these campaigns and they try to operationalize them in order to advance their destructive objectives. Um, so nevertheless, in the past couple of years, we have made great strides in combating BDS. Just a couple weeks ago, the German parliament passed a resolution equating BDS to anti-Semitism. And we're gonna hear a little bit about that today. And last year, the Danish government announced that it was no longer going to be providing grants to organizations that promote BDS. Um, but our, our esteemed panelists here today really are on the forefront of the BDS, of fighting BDS, confronting BDS. Um, they really, they take the battle to the BDS activists. Um, and I'm proud to call them all colleagues and friends. Their efforts have been essential in blunting BDS and holding governments and international institutions accountable. Um, so I'll make some introductions um, and then each speaker will give about a five minute, five to seven minute case study about how they've confronted BDS. And then I'll ask the panelists a few questions and then we'll hopefully have time to open it up to the floor. Um, so our first panelist is recognized as one of the world's preeminent experts in international law and the Arab-Israeli conflict, and a friend. <laughs> so we are very delighted to introduce Professor Eugene Kantorovich. <laughs> Professor Kantorovich currently teaches at the Antonin Scalia School of Law at George Mason University, specializing in constitutional and international law, 
and heads the International Law Department of the Kohelet Policy Forum, a Jerusalem-based think tank. Professor Kantorovich is the intellectual architect for many anti-BDS state laws in the United States. He holds a BA and JD degrees from the University of Chicago. Our next panelist is attorney Avi Segal, principal at the law offices of Abraham Moshe Segal and Company. Attorney Segal represents and works with many pro-Israel groups, including Shirat Adin. He has assisted Shirat Adin in many anti-terror cases, as well as anti-BDS litigation in Israel. Attorney Segal holds an LLB degree from Bar Ilan University. Next, we have attorney Jonathan Hoiberger, director of international cooperation at Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Diplomacy. Attorney Hoiberger has worked as an attorney advising governments, multinational corporations, and non-governmental organizations in the field of public international law and regulatory affairs, while serving as a research associate at the Center for Applied Negotiations at the Institute for the National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. He authored from the Madrid Conference to the Kerry Initiative, an insight into the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. He is a member of the German-Israeli Future Forum, an alumnus of the McKinsey Capstone Program, and the Gerhard Stark Foundation. And he holds an LLB and a BL. And our last panelist obviously needs no introduction. Um, I'll give a little brief bio anyway. <laughs> um, Nitsana Dershan Leitner is the president and founder of Shirat Tadim. She is the leading voice in the international fight against BDS and terror financing. Mrs. Dershan Leitner holds a law degree from Bar Ilan University and an MBA from Manchester University. She is regularly quoted in the international media as an authority on terror financing, and she's a huge inspiration to all of us here. Um, so why don't we open up, uh, Eugene, why don't we start with you? Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, one case study in the fight against economic warfare against Israel, which is what I prefer to call it. Uh, I think it's an easy trap to cop fall into the terminology of BDS, but it's probably not a good idea. Like the West Bank, it's not a phrase that we came up with, it's a phrase that was created for certain political purposes. So uh, one of the most important developments in economic warfare against, in the battle against economic warfare against Israel in the past several years has been the passage of the so-called anti-BDS state laws in 27 United States. Over the past three or four years, uh, a wave has really swept across the United States legislatures and starting with South Carolina and Illinois in 2015, uh, such laws are now on the books in a majority of U.S. states. So it's a real revolution, something that simply did not exist several years ago. Uh, and I'll say what the laws, uh, and I've been privileged to be closely involved in the uh, formulation and passage of these laws, uh, and I'll say a little bit about what they do and why they're important and now some of the challenges that these laws uh, themselves are encountering. The laws treat boycotting people or companies because of their Israel affiliation, just like many state laws treat boycotting people, refusing to do business with them, because of their race, uh, military status, gender, sexual orientation, religion, or many other characteristics. Many states have laws that say if you discriminate, if you boycott a company or business because of these characteristics, we, the state, will not do business with you, even if such conduct is illegal. We think it's discriminatory, we think it's bigoted, and we don't want to do business with bigoted companies, we don't want taxpayer money to go to indirectly subsidize your discriminatory activities. Uh, indeed, a executive order to this regard was signed by President Obama saying that the federal government will not contract with companies that boycott people on the basis of their sexual orientation. These laws take the approach that has been applied to sexual orientation, past veteran status, family status, and many other things, and apply it also to boycotts and discrimination based on Israel connection, connection to Israel. And they provide that a state will not do business with 
or invest its pension funds in companies that engage in this kind of discriminatory activity. Some states have chosen just to have contracting provisions, some states have uh, solely pension provisions, and many states, uh, probably the plurality, have both kinds of laws on the books. So these laws now, I think, are significant in a couple of ways. Uh, and I think the first and most important is the narrative significance. The, the story they tell and the story they allow us to tell. Because the biggest danger of the economic warfare campaign against Israel is not in the actual economic harm it inflicts on the state of Israel. That's also a concern. But the biggest and most immediate danger is in the general aura of delegitimization that the, uh, this campaign creates around Israel. The reason it makes sense for boycott activists to conduct their activities, which fail overwhelmingly. 99 out of 100 boycott campaigns go down in smoke. But even when they lose, they win. Even when they lose, they win, because nobody's talking about boycotting North Korea, uh, about boycotting Iran. No one's talking about boycotting China. These are not realistic campaigns. Those countries may be problematic, but they're not beyond the pale. So if you're talking about boycotting a country, it means it's beyond the pale. And that idea gets out there whether they win or lose. These laws enable us to say a message, which I, and I don't think we're capitalizing enough on the message this, these laws uh, let us say, that legislators in 27 states, Democrats and Republicans both, these laws were passed by overwhelming bipartisan majorities, overwhelmingly supported by Republicans, overwhelmingly supported by basically every legislator in the states uh, where, they were, uh, where they were enacted. Republicans and Democrats agree that boycotting companies or people because of their connection to Israel is a form of discrimination. It is legally like discriminating against gays, it is principally like that, and the state will treat it like that. It is a form of discrimination. It's not a human rights activity. It's not a benign activity, it's just bigotry. And this is a message that the vast majority of democratic state lawmakers across America have said. We need to capitalize on the fact that they have said it. And this is a message I think that's not getting uh, through across enough in campuses. This should be our number one talking point. Oh, are you talking about that activity that most democratic state legislators consider to be bigoted, have passed laws saying it's bigoted? I think that's a very important narrative point. But it also has a practical effect. It discourages companies from boycotting Israel. There are three C's to BDS, I like to say, three levels. Campuses, corporations, and countries. And campuses are, pr uh, present their own challenges, but the middle of level of companies may be the most daunting, because it has real economic consequences, potentially. And Airbnb is an example. But companies do not want to boycott Israel. Companies do not want to boycott Israel. Even when companies boycott Israel, it's not because they want to, it's because they've been pressured to. And how do we know this? And uh, I, have a, I had a great insight at the beginning of this legislative campaign that I got from Ian Anderson, who is the uh, lead singer and flautist for the band Jethro Tull. Uh, and uh, they, he plays very often in Israel. He likes the fans here. And is regularly targeted by boycott campaigns that have gotten more vocal uh, now that the Pink Floyd guy has made this his business. So he, he gave an interview and was asked what he thinks of these musicians who pressure boycotts. And he says, they're not rock and rollers. That was his great. He also said many dirty words. But he said, they're not really rock and rollers. What, what's it mean they're not rock and rollers? Because who is being targeted by the boycott campaigns? Right? The same, and it's the same with company. Musicians who already play in Israel, who have agreed to play in Israel, who have played concerts before and have a scheduled show. So these are musicians. We know they don't have a problem with Israel. We know they love the fans in Israel. And the only reason they're backing out is because of the pressure. And he says, that's not rock and roll. Right? Rock and roll is to go against authority, to be transgressive, not to buckle into social media campaigns. And the same with corporate boycotts. The boycott campaign does not start with AAA auto glass and work its way up right, in the phone book. They start with companies that are active in Israel. And that's how they found Airbnb, a company with a high social consumer profile that was active in Israel. And we know companies don't want to boycott, but they don't want to have to explain why they walked, why they, the directors had to walk through a die-in at the shareholder meeting. So the laws put a thumb on the other side of the scale. If they're asked, why do I have to deal with this headache at the shareholder meeting, I said, there's another headache that we don't want to deal with. It evens the playing field. And 
in the case of Airbnb, it's a classic example. We know that Airbnb wasn't dying to do this. They were subject to pressure by Human, right, Human Rights Watch and lots of other groups. In their statement announcing the boycott, they didn't say we're boycotting Israel because we don't like Israel, because we disagree with their policies. They didn't say any of those things. Rather, they referred to the pressure they had been put under. Uh, and uh, the state laws were one of the factors, including Nitzana's lawsuits, uh, that helped put pressure in the other direction. Uh, now, that was a case where a company actually boycotted and backed down. Most of the time, you're not going to see that. Most of the time, if these laws work, the company will know about them in advance and not engage in the boycott in the first place. So the laws, however, now are under attack. A final thing we can learn about these laws also leads to the challenges that they now face. One of the reasons they've been so excited, I think they showed the extraordinary gains we can get by taking the initiative, by going on the offensive. You know, before that, I think the, much of the approach to BDS was we would get calls, I would get calls, Nitsana would get calls. Ah, oh, there's a boycott campaign on my campus. They're saying anti-Semitic things. Come help. It's whack-a-mole. Right? There's 3,000 four-year colleges in America, and they can do this every year, uh, repeating it. But passing laws, you're taking the initiative. You're going on the attack. They have to respond. But now that the laws have been passed, the initiative has passed to the other side, uh, and it is the ACLU and the Council on American uh, Islamic Relations that is on the offensive. They have brought lawsuits challenging these laws on First Amendment grounds in several states. And these law, some, of these law, some of these challenges have been successful at the trial level. Some of them have been unsuccessful. And there's going to be a lot of litigation in appellate courts and, I expect, the Supreme Court. The argument is ultimately that these law, uh, laws restrict the freedom of speech by not allowing people to boycott Israel. Now, the reason that's not right is because choosing not to do business with people is simply not speech. If it were speech, all anti-discrimination laws would be in question. Because what's an anti-discrimination law say? If you choose not to do business with people because of certain characteristics, it's prohibited. These laws don't even prohibit the not doing business. They simply say that the state will not subsidize it. So the ACLU is willing to put all of the gains it has made in anti-discrimination law, many of which they have lobbied for themselves, to put that all on the line simply to secure the right to discriminate against Jews. All the freedoms from discrimination are worth nothing to them unless they're accompanied by the freedom to discriminate against Jews. Uh, I think this is a very telling sign about the direction of the progressive movement in the United States and uh, is very troubling. Many previously principled institutions are changing their stances. Uh, and I think the question one needs to ask the ACLU and its supporters repeatedly is, what's the difference between discriminating on the basis of Israel connection and discriminating on any other basis. The only answer I have heard is discrimination against gays is in boycotts, that's discrimination. But discrimination against Israeli companies, that's not discrimination, that's boycotts. Uh, and I don't know the principal difference between a boycott and discrimination. They're both refusals to deal. Uh, but this is going to be a big challenge uh, going forward. Um, and I think really shows a deep realignment of forces, uh, ideologies in the United States where the ACLU, which just several years ago when it was pushing President Obama to sign the executive order saying states will not contract with companies that boycott gays, back then they were saying states are not obligated to spend taxpayer money on action they find discriminatory. Now they have an entirely different First Amendment theory, uh, which happens to be perfectly tailored to be um, bad for the Jews. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of work to fight going forward. Thank you, Eugene. Um, Eugene was speaking about tactics that have uh, taken place in the United States to combat BDS. And now we're going to turn to Avi, who is going to speak about uh, local lawsuits taking place in Israel. Uh, thanks, Zan. Uh, thanks to uh, the other panel members. Thanks, Nisana and Avi for a very high-level conference and very interesting one. So I'm going to talk about the Israeli law, and the Israeli legislator have two central tools to do with the boycott of the State of Israel. The first tool is from the field of a private law, the prohibition of boycott law, which also incorrupt, incorporate administrative, administrative elements such as preventing participation in tenders, etc. The second tool is administrative tool, in essence, which is the entry into Israeli law, which gives the interior minister authority to, and I quote, 
a visa and resident permits of any kind shall not be issued to a person who is not an Israeli citizen or has a permanent resident permit in the state of Israel if he, the organization or body for which he is acting, knowingly published a public call for a boycott of the state of Israel through a boycott or has undertaken to participate in such a boycott. I should briefly discuss these two tools, private one and administrative one, and give examples of their implementation in the Israeli legal system. As stated, the first tool is the boycott law. The boycott law, the full name of the boycott law is law preventing harm to the state of Israel by means of boycott. The, the law states that, and I quote, boycott a civil wrong, he who knowingly publish a public call for a boycott against the state of Israel will according to the content and circumstances of the publication, there is a reasonably, reasonable possibility, probability, that the call will lead to a boycott, and he who published the, the call was aware for this possibility, will be considered to have committed a civil wrong to which the civil tort law, etc. This law contained a clause allowing the court to impose punitive damages without proof of damage. But immediately after its enactment, a petition was filed with the Supreme Court and this section was deleted from the law and as you know, sometimes even judges are making mistakes. The first time the boycott law was used was when the singer Lord canceled the performance in Israel. The singer wrote on social networks the two BDS activities, activists were the one that caused her to cancel her show in Israel. Immediately after the publication of this report, Shuat Adin organization revealed his teeth and found three admirers of the singer who were very disappointed with the cancellation of the performance. The three admirers came to my office and soon afterwards we filed a suit in, the, in Jerusalem court for 45,000 new Israeli shekels against these two BDS activists. The court allowed us to deliver the lawsuit out of the border of Israel and indeed after great effort by Shuat Adin organization and attorney Avi Gez of the organization, we managed to locate the BDS activists in their homeland and to produce the statement of claim to their hand. On October 2018, the Jerusalem court decided to accept the claim and charge these two BDS activists with the full amount of the claim plus court expenses and legal fee. This was the first, and to this moment also the last, lawsuit filed under the boycott law. The second tool, as noted, is the authority of the interior minister not to grant visas to BDS activists. In this case too, it was the Shuvat Adin organization and uh, NGO monitor that applied to the court in order to revoke a work permit for a BDS activist, Omar Shakir. After submitting the petition to the court, the interior minister announced that he had decided not to renew the visa, the work visa of that BDS activist. The decision meant, meant the expulsion of the activist from Israel, but this didn't end the story. The activist applied to the court to the district court in Jerusalem to cancel the new decision of the minister. We asked, we, NGO Monitor, uh, Shuwat Adin organization and other organization, asked to join as a party of the, uh, to the petition. And after several hearings, the Jerusalem district court decided to reject, to reject the petition of the BDS activist. The bottom line of the, of the judgment was, and I quote, in our case, it has been proven that the petitioner continued to publicly call for a boycott against the state of Israel, or part of it, and in the same breath, he wishes Israel to open its gate to him. On the basis of the above consideration, I find, I find that the decision of the minister 
the Minister of the Interiors, of, of the Minister of Interiors, not to allow to allow this uh, this to the petitioner is reasonable under the circumstances and does not justify intervention. Today, the same activist filed an appeal to the Supreme Court, and in the next few months, unfortunately, he's still here. There will be a hearing on the matter. In conclusion, there is no doubt that intelligence use of the tools provided by the legislator and uncompromising use of these tools constitute a significant tool for eliminating BDS. Uh, in the case of Mr. Shakir, I can say that instead of dealing with uh, and doing BDS, he's, he's, he's running from court to court asking, begging to stay in Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. And I think it's important to note that the, the Shakir case that Avi was just talking about, um, he was hired by Human Rights Watch to run the Israel desk here. Um, and he had a near decades long history of running uh, at BDS and anti-Israel campaigns in his university and then he worked for BDS organizations. And I think, you know, Eugene was talking about the ACLU um, and how they are now at the forefront of the BDS movement in the United States. But Human Rights Watch has also unfortunately taken upon that role. Um, and I think it's very important that we continue to expose these organizations and how they've uh, turned away from universal human rights uh, to advance extremist political objectives. Um, so now we're going to get a government perspective. Uh, so we'll turn to Jonathan, who will talk about his work at the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Uh, thank you, Anne. First of all, I also would like to join my colleagues and congratulate you, Nitsana, and your team, uh, not only for organizing this excellent conference, but also for all the amazing work you do um, throughout the year and in the past years. You know, it's quite easy maybe to have some isolated success here and there, but it's very difficult to maintain such a level of commitment and persistence over the years. Kola um, The BDS campaign, how we refer to it, we do not call it a movement, because movement sounds very peaceful, non-violent or grassroots, which it is, it is not. The BDS campaign is nothing else but a smear campaign against the Jewish state. The state of Israel, an island of democracy, progress, and innovation in the Middle East. The BDS campaign is very well coordinated and well funded and has raised about 100 million shekel, about $25 million in the last four years. For many years, one of the accusations presented to the Israeli government was that the government somehow exaggerates or enlarges the phenomenon by branding the label BDS. But this is an argument which is very hard for me to accept. Tell this to Jewish students on campus in the United States who get arrested and intimidated against when standing up for Israel. Tell this to the Israeli academic who gets excluded from a professional conference in South Africa attended by all the experts in his field. Why? because he's Israeli. I'll tell this to the Israeli companies whose products get taken off shelves in supermarkets in France by so-called inspectors. It has nothing to do with international law or human rights, but it has all to do with anti-Semitism. The, minist <laughs> the Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Public Diplomacy was actually established in 2006 but in October 2015, the Security Cabinet assigned the Ministry of Strategic Affairs uh, to act against delegitimization and boycott campaigns against the State of Israel. Uh, this decision actually followed a multitude of testimonies, incidents, and data about the existence of a coordinated campaign among organizations to revoke Israel's legitimacy as a home for the Jewish people by calling for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. This campaign includes moves and actions against Israel in terms of economics, academia, culture, lawfare, and the field of public opinion. And within this framework, 
um, the ministry and the leadership of Minister Gilad Erdan, who spoke yesterday, uh, developed a task force to counter delegitimization. I would like to emphasize, because I get asked this question quite a lot uh, in the legal sphere, it is still the office of the Attorney General who is the main authority in Israel to represent Israel in courts outside of Israel or to initiate litigation on behalf of the state. And furthermore, the cabinet decision also stipulates that um, any activity abroad outside Israel is to be carried out in coordination with our colleagues of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. When it comes to strategy, the leadership of the ministry quite at the beginning of this enormous task understood that best equipped to fight delegitimization and BDS is civil society together with the government. Along the paradigm, it needs a network to fight a network. And in this context, the ministry empowers and coordinates the work of three major networks. The first one is the GC4I, the Global Coalition for Israel, a network of almost 170 pro-Israeli and Jewish organizations abroad, represented by their re respective presidents or chief executive officers. The second network is the digital network, which consists of 70 social media and public relations experts who together have a reach of 15 million people on social media platforms. And the third network, and this is the network that I'm responsible for, is the Legal Network Initiative, which consists of over 300 attorneys from all continents dedicated to defending Israel's international legal standing and is very much involved in pro-Israel legal advocacy. The power of this network lies in its coordinated approach and just to give you one example which has already been mentioned, when Airbnb decided to discriminate against Jewish homeowners in Judea and Samaria, <coughs> lawyers of the network, including Shurat Adin, took different legal action in the US and in Israel, and also on different legal grounds. And I think this not only made Airbnb reverse their decision, but also deterred other companies to follow through with such discriminatory policies. One of our main roles, I think, is to inform the wider public about the phenomenon, the key players, and formulate concrete policy recommendations. So in January 2019, the Ministry published its second money trail report on EU funding that goes directly or indirectly to delegitimization organizations. Two months later, the Ministry went on to publish um, the terrorist in suits report. I have it here. Outlining over 100 direct links between designated terrorist organizations, such as the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and Hamas, and NGOs that promote uh, BDS. The report also presents the identities of 30 leaders of the BDS campaign, and was referred to by one of the senior BDS leaders, Salah Khawaja, as the greatest threat to the BDS campaign. The third report the ministry published is a report called The Big Scam, which shows how PAKBI, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel organization from Ramallah, led a coordinating, coordinated campaign with bots and trolls to boycott the 2019 Eurovision Song Contest. And as you know, they did not succeed. Not one artist canceled his participation. You can download all of these reports on our website, forayl.org.il. We have it in English, we have it in, in Hebrew. Um, I was also asked uh, to address the recent uh, parliamentary motion adopted by the German parliament, the Bundestag on 17 May 2019, connecting the arguments and methods of BDS to anti-Semitism. I think uh, this courageous and firm stand taken by the large majority of the federal parliament, including parties from the coalition and the opposition, is a milestone in the diplomatic and legal fight against BDS and cannot be overstated. Uh, first to clarify, this resolution is not a law, it's a parliamentary motion, kind of a declaration of intent. 
and it binds only the parliament itself. So in accordance with the re resolution, the parliament will not provide facilities to groups that promote BDS and not provide funding to any groups denying Israel's right to exist. The decision of the German parliament, the resolution, refers to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, working definition on anti-Semitism, which gives examples for anti-Semitic notions or statements or acts. For example, comparison, comparisons between Israel and Nazi policy, demonizing Israel by applying a double standard to it, uh, then to other states, and denying um, of all the people, only the Jewish people, with the right to self-determination. In this context, I would like to mention something uh, smart that I once heard uh, Abe Foxman say, the former leader of the Anti-Defamation League. If your ide ideology is to reject all kinds of nation states, all kinds of national movements, you believe that everyone should be living in a world without states, without borders, if that's your ideology, that may be fine. But you, if you accept the nation state of the British, of the French, of all national movements, but the only national movement that you reject is Zionism, the Jewish movement for self-determination, and the homeland for its people, the state of Israel, then you are an anti-Semite. <laughs> Examples of uh, policies adopted by the German authorities, um, very recently, we already see that the resolution has had a very uh, uh, strong effect. Um, they denied the participation of an American singer at uh, an event after he um, failed to denounce BDS. Uh, a bank in Germany closed uh, an account of uh, a BDS organization. And uh, they also prevented the public appearance of uh, very uh, popular uh, BDS leaders just last weekend. I want to say on the background of this resolution, um, this was a very strong effort by mainly the pro-Israeli and the Jewish organizations in Germany on the ground that pushed for the passing of such a resolution. And in this context, I also want to highlight the excellent work of the Federal Commissioner for Jewish Life in Germany in the fight against anti-Semitism, Dr. Klein, who at a very early stage said that BDS was anti-Semitic and that the statement that Israel was an apartheid state was also anti-Semitic, and he said that at a time when it wasn't that popular as it is now. And uh, I firmly believe that he owes much of our respect for his clarity uh, on these issues. Um, I want to end on a, a short note. I think the European idea to establish a dynamic and active civil society in the Palestinian territories after Oslo was not a bad idea. The concept of democratization uh, after the Oslo Accords, but what came of it was dozens of, and dozens of organizations who have one goal, to delegitimize the state of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people. And I asked myself the question, where are the NGOs who advocate for LGBT rights, for women's rights, for children, do they not need an active civil society? Not so in the Palestinian territories, where many BDS groups, and many of them funded by member states of the EU, have a very clear anti-dialogue, anti-coexistence, and anti-Israel agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And we've heard a, several of the speakers mention the Airbnb case. And Nitsana and Shireta Dean have done amazing work on that case, really uh, spearheaded the litigation. Uh, so we are fortunate to hear from her to speak about her efforts. Um, so hi, everyone, again. Thank you for all your compliments. I just want to emphasize that um, Shireta Dean is a team of lawyers and I'm very happy, proud, and honored to be just one of them. And uh, perhaps I will take this opportunity to uh, thank them all for participating in this fight. So we have Rachel Weiser, who did a tremendous job in the conference, but she's an amazing lawyer. We 
have Avi Gaze that runs around here. We have Bora who sits uh, in the office, somebody has to do some work. We have Avi Sega that joined our team just in recent years. Fearless lawyer. Um, and we have other lawyers that we work with around the world. And we obviously we have my husband, Avi Leitner. So this is the team behind Surat Adin's legal fight. And indeed, in recent years, we've been taking cutting edge cases against the uh, BDS, um, you can, don't call it movement, campaign. Um, only in cases that you can really demonstrate a boycott because the uh, uh, boycott uh, organizers are very smart. They hide behind freedom of speech. They hide behind freedom of academy, freedom of organization. Um, nobody can sue someone who calls to boycott Israel. They are protected. You can only bring a lawsuit and let, um, with the exception of the Israeli law that uh, Avi spoke about. Um, so the only way you can bring a legal action against BDS activists is to re really boycott Israel. So the Airbnb case is a great example. When Airbnb announced that they are going to boycott um, Jewish homes in Judea and Samaria, they said they no, no longer want to be uh, active in occupied territories and therefore they are not going to, going to allow uh, homes from Judea and Samaria to be listed in their, on the website. But they didn't delist the homes of the Palestinian owners or Christians or Muslims. They went only after the Jews, only in Jewish communities. They didn't go in Ramallah or in Nablus or other places. And they also didn't boycott in other so-called occupied territories in the world, like Northern Cyprus, like Western Sahara, like Tibet. So this is a form of discrimination against Jews based on their religion. And now we can bring a lawsuit. Where will we bring the lawsuit? Could we brought it in Israel, but we were afraid that it will not have any effect. It's better to sue them in their home base in the United States. And then the best jurisdiction for us was Delaware, where Airbnb is incorporated. And now we need plaintiffs. We needed to find American citizens because we are suing in the United States under an American law that own houses in Judea and Samaria and rent them on Airbnb site. It was quite difficult, I must say. We did put a post on our Facebook page and we made calls, but in the end we got assisted by the head of Yesha that called me up and said, I love the idea, what do you need me to do? I said, find me American citizens that own houses in your territory. He was able to get some, and in the end we wind up in, with 12 uh, American citizens that own houses and agreed to serve as plaintiffs. And the law, um, which we stood under was the fair housing law. This is a law that uh, prohibits any discrimination when it comes to houses, when it comes to rent. Uh, in the United States, you cannot announce that you are not renting to black people or to Chinese or obviously to LGBT um, uh, community members. So this is a great law. We have the plaintiffs, we have the venue, we filed the lawsuit. And within two months, Airbnb lawyers, which we were in touch with from the beginning, you know, extensions, some uh, negotiation before filing motion to dismiss or respond to motion to dismiss, called us up and said that they would like to settle the case out of court. And apparently they realized that it is an act of discrimination based on religions, religion, that indeed they will not be able to defend this act in court. And perhaps they made a mistake. Perhaps they collapsed the pressure of the BDS movement. Um, and they should correct what they did. In addition to the lawsuit, this is 
what something uh, sometimes we like to do, we launch a public campaign. So we came up with a video um, illustrating how Airbnb boycotts uh, Jews. Um, we approach these 22 states. Uh, there are state attorneys, those states that have anti-BDS laws that uh, Eugene uh, geniusly promoted. And uh, we told them Airbnb boycotts um, Jews and therefore you should enforce the law, the anti-BDS law on Airbnb. And indeed, at least two governors from Texas and from Florida immediately answered and said that they are going to um, take actions against Airbnb. And uh, we also knew that Airbnb is going, is going to an IPO. So we contact the ACC and we are about to uh, let them know what problematic Airbnb is doing and what end discrimination policy they carry. And having all that, Airbnb come to us and ask us to settle the case. We agreed to settle the case. Um, we felt that the victory will be for Israel, will be for the Jewish community. Uh, in the end of the day, the uh, Jewish homeowners, the plaintiffs, did not get harmed yet because Airbnb just announced its policy, did not exercise it yet. And we came into a settlement agreement. It's confidential, but I can tell you that there is one clause that Airbnb insisted on. It's with where, when Airbnb or when we will be able to publish the settlement agreement. And that would be at the night of the elections results published in Israel. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the clause says that the parties are allowed to announce this existence of the settlement at 11 p.m. in Israel on Tuesday, the day of the elections. So when Bibi Netanyahu and Gantz were fighting for a couple of minutes, who is the prime minister, we got our PR consultant, Dana, who's, I hope is, she's here, she's doing an excellent work, and she got it on AP, and from here you can imagine it went out all over the world. So this is one case. that we uh, were very successful and I'm, I'm proud of it. Um, but sometimes you can take an action and not particularly legal action. You don't have to go to court in order to convince your opponent that he's wrong. And these are the cases that we are doing with the Strategic Service Office, uh, which we sometimes serve as their gun to hire. Um, the Strategic so Service Office uh, Jonathan did not mention, has an intelligence uh, branch. And there are people who are searching and giving the information and digging in and coming up uh, who's boycotting, which organizations is involved, uh, which banks carry out this uh, account for these organizations. So at least in two different occasions, there were uh, platforms that carried accounts or provided services to BDS organizations. One of them was Donor Box. This is a platform, a crowdsourcing platform that the major BDS organization, it's called BMC, BDS National Council. Yeah, there is such an organization apparently. They wanted to raise funds and they launched a crowdsourcing campaign on the Donor Box platform. And the, uh, so this was where office came to us and said, can you stop them? Can you convince Donnerbox to shut down the campaign for BNC? We sent them a warning letter, and this is where it stopped. Simple warning letter. They convinced Donnerbox that it's not worth their while to keep this platform open. In the letter, we emphasize that the BNC that looks very innocent, it's just an umbrella group for the BDS organizations. Actually, some of these members is a PFLP and even Hamas. And none American company want to be involved with connections or aiding and abetting Hamas or PFLP, which are designated organizations. Donor Box immediately shut down the campaign for BNC. <laughs> and 
the recent one, which was on the Jerusalem Post today, is the German bank. The name is Social Bank of Social Economy, uh, which had an account for a BDS organization called Jews for Just Justice in Palestine. You know what, sometimes I think that they ran out of names. Why? There is Jews for Justice for Palestine. This is Jews for Just Justice in Palestine. <laughs> and the Jewish organization, and they had an account in the German bank. For a year and a half, I was told that the Solicitor General's office tried to convince the German bank that BDS um, is against Israel, is fighting to, uh, against the existence of the state of Israel. They should shut down the account. The bank almost shut down, but again, under pressure of the BDS movement, they declined. Until we came to the picture, we sent them a warning letter telling them that the BDS organization, these Jews for Just, Justice for Palestine, actually involved with some terrorism. They have uh, ex-terrorists coming and uh, speak for them. It was Rasmia Ode a one that terrorist from 1968 terror attack in the supermarket in, uh, in Israel that um, in recent years was deported from the United States rather than was involved in his deportation. We worked with the DA um, over there. And, um, and she is coming and speaking to the BDS organization. And we emphasize in our letter what happens to American companies that have ties with terror funding, with terrorism. They can be sued, they can pay hundreds of millions of dollars, and we figure, you know, if they Google Shurat Adin's name, they see that we already have some judgments like this. And indeed, the German bank shut down the account. Thank you, Nate Zana. Um, so I have a few questions for the panelists, and uh, I may direct questions to specific panelists, but feel free to weigh in um, if anyone has comments. Um, I wanted to turn to Eugene. Uh, one thing we haven't discussed yet is the, is the UN's role in BDS, and currently the UN Human Rights Council is working on a database of companies that they claim are involved in, quote, settlement business. Um, and this process started in March of 2016. They have written some reports about it. They've compiled a list of about 200 companies. But thanks to the efforts of, of many of us and other people um, in the room, uh, this process has been delayed uh, by the High Commissioner of Human Rights for the past two years. Um, but I wanted, Eugene also was very active in a counter campaign to this, this discriminatory database. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the report you put out last year. Sure. So the Human Rights Council is preparing this, what they call database, uh, also known as a blacklist, of companies with any kind of ties to uh, business in uh, what they call the West Bank. Um, they have a, there's a resolution that calls on the High Commissioner to create this database. Uh, and we thought, what if the Human Rights Council wasn't so obsessed with Israel? What if it just took the word Israel out of the relevant resolutions? So the resolution would have called for the High Commissioner to make a database of companies doing business in occupied territories. Not Israeli occupied territories, just occupied territories. I thought, what would, what would that database look like? And it's interesting to see, because if doing business in occupied territories is a human rights issue when Jews are involved, presumably it's a human rights issue when anyone's involved, because that's the thing about human rights. All you have to do is be human. So, the, uh, so, so we looked at businesses in places like Western Sahara, Northern Cyprus, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Crimea, and we, we, we didn't have just one publication. Uh, my think tank, Forum Kahelet, published now two volumes of our report, which is called Who Else Profits? The Scope of EU and Multinational Business in Occupied Territories. And we see that some of the world's largest companies, in particular large European uh, industrial and finance companies, Siemens, Orange, Credit Agricole, Santander, uh, are all engaged in a major business in these territories. Not like uh, Airbnb, a couple hundred units in uh, Tsimurim 
in, uh, in Yesha, uh, contracts with the Moroccan government, con contracts with the Turkish government for hundreds of million dollars of dollars for building infrastructure. And the point here is not to show, oh, they're, they're also bad. The point uh, is that companies like Siemens, Satanda, they don't go in uh, for a $100 million contract with Morocco without consulting their foreign ministries, without consulting a bunch of international lawyers. Is it legal to do business in disputed territories? And we know they had such consultations and they were told, absolutely, it's absolutely okay. And the ubiquity of this kind of business is a demonstration that the only problem with this business, regardless of the status of the territories, is the involvement of Jews on one end of the transaction. Uh, but we also hope to illustrate by these Who Else Profits reports that uh, businesses in many countries, many uh, countries that have not been as tough as they should be about opposing the blacklist, will themselves suffer as a consequence. Because while the UN effort is clearly targeted only at Israel, they intend that they're aimed squarely at Israel, they don't care about Western Sahara. I gave this report to the Sawahari at the United Nations, that's the, the Front Polisario, the PLO of uh, Western Sahara, and they, were, they stormed into the High Commissioner's office, why are you discriminating against us? But no one really cares uh, what they think, um, in a political level. But in a legal level, it is hard to maintain this kind of acoustic separation. And the Sawahari, the Polisario, have already started bringing cases, the Azerbaijanis are likely to bring cases, against European entities saying, you have to live, what you say is true in Israel has to be true in the rest of the world. And that threatens the business of these companies around the world. I think it's important to point out that the High Commissioner is writing a check uh, with respect to Israel that is going to be paid for by uh, countries like France and Spain and the UK uh, around the world. Um, and again, it underscores uh, generally the hypocrisy uh, of, the, of this effort, which has been delayed, but I think um, we have to realistically expect that it may happen at some point. On a related note, um, in Ireland, there's a bill currently pending to, in Europe in general, there's a lot of um, controversy over what they call labeling guidelines for products that are produced in Judea and Samaria and the Golan Heights. Um, but Ireland has taken it a step farther, and BDS activists have worked very closely with a particular member of the Irish Parliament to actually boycott goods from those areas in Ireland, but also to criminally fine uh, people who come here and may purchase you know, a book or, or have a tour or, or stay in an Airbnb even, um, and then go back to Ireland. Very high criminal monetary fines as well as um, potential jail time. Um, so I wanted to ask the panel, um, would, the, would the Israeli BDS law be something that we could use to combat against that? Or what other measures might we be able to take in order to combat this discriminatory law, which is likely to pass given the politics in Ireland. I'm not sure the Israeli law can uh, apply to uh, this incident where Ireland decides to, by law, to boycott um, uh, products from uh, the West Bank. Um, but we should look into it. <laughs> And, and, and try to find something. But I won't tell you that um, it didn't come into action yet. But if it does, uh, we're already thinking that um, maybe there is a way to tie um, big Israeli companies to the West Bank and come and sue companies in Ireland that sell products from Israeli companies that are not uh, uh, physically in the West Bank. So I'm talking about, you know, Intel, if they have some ties to the West Bank, or uh, um, Teva, if they have some uh, uh, ties to the West Bank, or anything that has with big, major, huge Israeli companies that we know that people in Ireland will not boycott, we know that stores in Ireland will not uh, take off their shelves, and come and sue these companies in Ireland and say, you are violating your Ireland law. Um, we also thought on a crazy idea, <laughs> like this is not crazy enough, um, to come and say the, uh, 
New Testament is actually a book about people from the West Bank. <laughs> all the libraries in Ireland and all the hotels that carry out the New Testament based on this law. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there is another way to, uh, to attack it. Um, perhaps you should elaborate, but it, it makes no sense for, for Ireland to come and determine right now what is not part of the state of Israel, not what will not be in the future part of the state of Israel. In the end of the day, we have the Oslo Accord. The Oslo Accords agreed that the final uh, sol solution, final uh, status, <laughs> will be determined in negotiation and not by European country that decides to take this element in and this element out. So this law is totally uh, um, immoral, illegal from our perspective. Unfortunately, Ireland is an independent country. They can legislate their own laws. All we can do is to go on the offense against it. The, uh, the Irish law is close to passing and it has not yet passed. As a result, not of, uh, you know, the things that are keeping it from being enacted are external political pressures and the maintenance of those uh, external political pressures are key. That is to say, both houses of the Irish Parliament have passed this law. It has not been enacted. The last stage has not been taken by the government because they're afraid of two kinds of things. They're afraid that it violates Ireland's responsibilities in the EU in terms of European supremacy in foreign trade arrangements. So they have a question whether it's legal under EU treaties. Okay, they might overlook that under other circumstances. They're also very concerned about the reaction from the US. Uh, and we know, because the government has said this publicly in meetings with the ministers, they're afraid about what this would mean for Irish com big US companies with Irish operations like Intel, like Apple, under the US anti-BDS laws. There has been extraordinary pressure from the Trump administration on the Irish government to not enact this. The Trump administration has uh, made it very clear that this would result, that it would be seen as a serious breach uh, by Ireland and have significant trade consequences, and they're worried about that. So those are the kind of, uh, those are the kind of top level political pressures that are needed. That said, I'm in a sense quite pleased with the Irish law. Uh, I think it's, it's, happy, uh, it's a happy thing in some ways, uh, because the, one of the things we hear about uh, opposition to Israeli policies is that, you know, it's not about Israel, it's about occupation. People are just, people are just against occupation, Occ occupation under international law. That's the problem. And the Irish bill is indeed called the Control of Economic Activity, Occupied Territories Act. Uh, and it says, it says it is a law about business in occupied territories. The law does not mention Israel at all. But it takes a definition of occupied territories that is not the one in the Geneva Conventions, that is not the one in any international treaty, and they have a complicated five-step filtering of what occupation means for the purposes of this law, such that it could only apply to one country in the world. And indeed, they were asked, uh, some of the NGOs, TRICARE, uh, TROCARE, TRICARE, TROCA, were asked, were asked who sponsored, who, um, the, the senator who sponsored uh, Francis Black is a former uh, pop singer. She didn't really write the law, but some of these NGOs did write the law, and they were asked, and they issued a press release, like uh, frequently asked questions. One is, what's this going to do to our business with Morocco? When, uh, when it applies to Western Sahara, they said, we got you covered. The definition is made to apply to only one country. So we know now that when people say occupied territories under international law, they're not talking about international law. It is a term of art for the Jewish state. And the clarification of that issue is, I think, almost worth the price of admission. <laughs> uh, I have a question, maybe Abby can answer this. Um, so there have been several BDS activists that have been blocked from coming into the country. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. 
Um, and, and maybe uh, distinguish, there was a case of a student at Hebrew University and why she was allowed to come in the country, but why now the Human Rights Watch official um, may or may not be uh, forced to leave the country. Okay, so uh, there was a case in the High Supreme Court. Uh, uh, one student got a visa for uh, uh, the, uni the Hebrew University to, to learn here. And uh, when she came to the airport, they, they stopped her and uh, want to uh, uh, impose back to the USA. And then she went to the High Supreme Court and, and tell to the High Supreme Court, listen, it's true that I was a BDS activist. The university applied, it's, it's true, with her, of course. And, and she said, uh, it's true that I was a, a BDS activist, but uh, from, I, I'm, I'm coming here only to learn. I'm not going to deal, I'm not going to be a member of an uh, of, uh, organization, that, uh, a BDS organization. I'm not going to take any act, any BDS act. She almost, uh, he, he, she and the university almost cried to the, to the High Supreme Court, and then the High Supreme Court said, okay, she's not going, we are not going to punish her on the, on the act that she took uh, in the past, and she's declaring in front of us that she's not, she's not going to take any other BDS acts. This is achievement itself, that uh, a BDS activist is declaring in front of the court in, uh, in an affidavit and saying that he's not going to take any BDS acts while he's here. And then, in, because of that, and because of the, pro, pro, uh, the fact that our High Supreme Court is amazing court and pluralist, they, they uh, let her stay here and, and learn about Israel. Hopefully, she will learn that Israel is, uh, is as, as said, uh, uh, on, the only democracy here in the area and, and, and all this stuff. But, in the other case that we talk about, Omar Shakir's case, the, uh, and we, we, we've been together in the session, and the judge asked the lawyer of Omar Shakir, uh, almost, you know, tell me, is he, going, is he going to act, to do BDS acts while he's here? I want to hear from him, like the student, the, the, I, I don't remember his name, but the, the, the student that come to the Hebrew University, I want to hear from him that he's not going to, he's gonna stop, uh, um, doing BDS uh, activities, and he refused. And this was one of the reasons that the judge decided that he cannot stay in Israel. Actually, uh, uh, I didn't know that you're going to ask the question, but but I, I, I translate a few paragraphs from the from the judgment, and and the judge said that the petitioner actions since he's entered to, into Israel reflect the fact that he continue to promote public boycott of Israel, although not now in the stage of conference and panels in the university, but by other acts. She said, uh, for example, uh, one of the, the activity that he, he did is to uh, state, she, she's writing it, for example, a stated the petitioner took part in, in the activity of removing Israeli soccer teams from World Football Association and even went to Bahrain, he went to Bahrain for, for, this, uh, for, for this purpose. So uh, the, the difference between the, the, the two cases, and I think that the High Supreme Court will, when, when, when there will be a session in, in a few months, he will, he will ask him again, let him, let him again opportunity to say, I'm not a BDS activist, I'm not going to do any, any act, and, and if, he will, he will do so, and if uh, Omar Shakir will declare on the stage of the High Supreme Court that he is not going to take any acts of BDS, this is this itself is a is a is a huge victory. I just want to add that uh, we are in this case since 2016, so it's been three years that Omar Shakir is sitting in Israel working as a director of the desk of Human Rights Watch in Israel, issuing reports condemning Israel, encouraging people to boycott Israel. He's the one who stood behind the report who profits that pushed Airbnb to boycott the settlements. 
he will keep doing it and we will just keep fighting him in court and I'm afraid that the Israeli Supreme Court or the entire uh, legal system will keep him here. He just stays, um, he may, you know, he may just reside here, may have children here and grandchildren here and uh, we'll just keep fighting him in court. I guess his uh, job security is better than Bibi Netanyahu. <laughs> He's just here to stay. And, and it's a little bit um, a problem when you come and take these laws that Israel enacted, the uh, uh, entry law that prohibits BDS activists to enter Israel and get the authorities actually to execute it, to enforce it. Um, the ministries are afraid, um, and this is, the, this is the reason, for instance, why this student from Hebrew University came into Israel uh, only after they realized that she's actually a BDS activist, and then they held it at the airport, something unheard of. Um, so the hesitation of the authorities to exercise this law with the fear of the court to enforce this law undermine the achievements of the uh, legislator. Yeah, it's a, it's a really egregious case. I think what prompted us to get involved was when his, he and his lawyer made statements to the court initially that he had nothing to do with HRW's campaign to have FIFA, the World Soccer Federation, to sanction Israel. And the fact was the guy got on a plane to go to Bahrain. Bahrain wouldn't let him in. He was blocked from entering Bahrain in order to get Israel sanctioned at the FIFA meeting. So it's amazing that Bahrain would not let him in to lobby FIFA. But we have problems here to, um, protecting ourselves from people who try to damage us economically. Um, so that for us was also the, the uh, motivating factor um, in that case. But we'll turn to our current official. Um, and uh, I know you don't want to comment on that case, Jonathan, but maybe you could talk about an initiative that you're, a new initiative you're launching for um, young people and students within Israel um, to counter BDS. Um, so, uh, in the past uh, two or three years, most of our efforts were kind of directed uh, empowering the networks abroad, uh, Jewish and pro-Israeli organizations and lawyers and, and bloggers. But uh, just very recently now, uh, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs has launched a very uh, wide and large-scale um, campaign to uh, include Israelis who want to fight against BDS and who want to be involved, um, a kind of a call to action to Israelis to be included in that, uh, in that fight. Um, it includes, uh, first of all, uh, the website and the Telegram group. It uh, includes um, work in the public relations sphere and um, a TV spot that is being shown uh, every evening before the main news. So we kind of, in, uh, very recently, the minister announced just last week, I think, uh, reached out also to Israelis. Because in many cases, it's really also Israelis who get harmed uh, by these uh, boycott initiatives. I mentioned the example of the Israeli academic, but um, also Israeli companies. Um, I want to say, because we discussed here a lot of case studies, which is, was excellent, in general, the BDS campaign uh, is a failure. Uh, it has largely failed, it has had no effect on the Israeli economy. The Israeli economy is stronger than ever, uh, with a very uh, steady and um, continuous growth. Um, and I think, uh, it is due not only to our work, but uh, to the work of, of many uh, who are active in, in this field. So it is a, is a, in the econ economic field, it is a huge failure, the BDS campaign, but it has the potential of harming Israel in uh, what we call the court of public opinion. And I think that is also something where you all can uh, get involved, may it be in one of our networks, the legal, the digital, or the GCFRI, may it be uh, with the work of Nitsana and other experts, or NGO Monitor, it's just, uh, it's just great that so many people uh, take part in this uh, common effort. Um, if there are any questions from the floor, we're happy to take them. I don't know if uh, anyone handed the papers in, uh, but while I'm, I'm waiting to see. Um, one of the areas I think also where, I think it's very true, we have to keep things in perspective. Israel's doing great. Our economy, thank God, is doing great. 
record numbers of tourism, high tech, um, it's, all, it's all good news. Um, but I think one area where BDS has the biggest negative impact is on campuses, um, demoralizing Jewish students, and creating a very hostile atmosphere, both in Europe and in the United States. And I was just wondering if our panelists have any comments about what we can do to support students on campus um, or to, to block uh, BDS efforts there. Um, we have, first of all, we have advocacy groups on campus uh, that do independently from us do, do work to, to strengthen pro-Israeli uh, students on campus. When there has been cases of discrimination or when BDS activists try to hijack the campus for anti-Israel propaganda, they have also been lawyers uh, quite active uh, on campus in the United States. Uh, one case which I mentioned in this context is a case um, which was uh, led by the Lawfare Project recently uh, settled at California State University um, in which the outcome was that um, the university had to admit that um, anti-Zionism uh, is anti-Semitism. And I think this uh, statement by the university will have a very positive effect on other campuses in the United States trying to uh, ban uh, incitement against Israel. Um, so I think there are different organizations and, and not every organization is best equipped to deal with every issue. Not always you need lawyers to uh, be active on campus. There are uh, many uh, campus groups. I will not name them because otherwise I forget any of the organizations. But um, yeah, so, so, so they do great work for a few years now. Um, and uh, that's what I can say. Do we have time for a few audience questions? I will, um, you have questions? Okay, great. No, no. Because I just was about to say you're that if boss, you really you want to. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, you're right, Jonathan, that, uh, that the effect of the BDS movement did not harm Israel economically. And the major harm of the BDS is the world opinion, the public opinion, mainly in the campuses when there are young students that are about to form their mind, their, their views, and the last thing Israel, Israel wants to tell the students is to perceive as an apartheid state, that one that violates human rights, that one that should be singled out and boycott um, among the nations. And But unfortunately, we in Israel have no ability to help the campuses in the United States. And quite frankly, none of the Jewish organizations have the ability to do so. It's only up to the students. It's only up to the students because if there are other students that call to boycott Israel, that demonstrate, that put an apartheid wall in the apartheid week, and put soldiers with blood, uh, uh, students dressed up as soldiers, Israeli soldiers with blood on their hands and little babies, Palestinians uh, running around them and, and do all these horrible things against Jewish students, the Jewish students have to get up and fight back. It's not, <laughs> listen, it's, it's not going to be one big victory, it's going to be in every campus, one after another, one after another, everywhere the BDS act, uh, activists and campaign is heard. But the only people that can fight against this is the students. And yeah, they have to get dirty. Yes, it's a street fight. It's a street fight. So if there is a broken bottle, they have to hit with a broken bottle. If there is a broken antenna, they have to take it and hit with it. This is it. They hit us so hard. We have to hit them back without hands tied behind our back. With full force, it's a war, and if it's fought well, we can win it. Okay, we have time for just a few questions. Um, and actually, this is sort of a, a, a good question following what Nitsana just said, and it's probably most apt for Nitsana or Eugene, but obviously anybody on the panel who would like to answer. Can disruptors of Jewish campus events be sued uh, under First Amendment rights? 
Can they be sued under the First Amendment? The disruptors for stopping uh, people from being able to speak, like when you have a, a pro-Israel speaker come and they're booed so loud they have to exit and sometimes even uh, be escorted out by security. Is there, a, is there a lawsuit on behalf of the speaker and is there a lawsuit on behalf of the students who don't get to hear what he has to say? Uh, so this actually happened to me uh, a few months ago uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, I didn't have to exit, nobody ever has to exit. Uh, but the question depends in part if it's a public university or a private university. Um, but in the case of a private university, is the easiest. Uh, and it depends also who the disruptors are, if they're students, if they're, out, if they're not students, if they're outside activists. But potentially someone who is not invited to an event and uh, is not part of the implied licensees, the people who are the implied invitees to the event, could be a trespasser and the owners of the premises could have them arrested and potentially prosecuted for trespass. I'm not sure that's such a great idea. Uh, I think it would tend to make victims of them and generally be overkill rel rel relative to the offense. We normally do not uh, prosecute incidental or minor trespasses. Uh, to the extent that the student's disciplinary action can be taken against them, I can tell you that in my case, the University of Chicago acted um, very seriously and very strictly uh, against the students who uh, were involved in the disruption. But uh, I'd like to generally repeat what I said to the students who were there at the, at the time and people who took an interest in it. Um, the first and most important response is for us not to uh, see such disruptions as um, horrible, scary, dangerous, not to get so upset. That is to say, there's a, there's a thing going around campuses where everybody melts if someone says uh, boo to them. Uh, and th there's a certain desire to uh, wrap ourselves in the warm blanket uh, of safe spaces, but uh, I think it's not going to work in the long run. I think Jewish students need to be tough. I think they need to know that there are people who hate us. I think these speakers who, for example, tried, there was, there was, um, there was four of them maybe, but they were very loud, uh, who came to disrupt my protest. Uh, one of the things I was trying to talk about was the uh, anti-Semitic nature of uh, the boycott movement. Uh, I think they made the point better than I could have in a long and scholarly lecture. I think the hate that was evident in their eyes uh, said more than anything I could say. Uh, our students are very comfortable. They don't, the hate scares them. Uh, and we need to tell them uh, not to be so upset. And uh, we should be happy that this is the greatest discomfort an American college student has to uh, suffer through. That said, we cannot create a situation in which speakers are afraid to come to campuses because they, uh, because pe many people are indeed have a, uh, have a, a, a smaller uh, threshold uh, than I do for unpleasantness. Uh, so we don't want to, but at the same time we need to not exaggerate uh, how terrible this is and try to turn it against them by saying, look, they're not letting the students hear viewpoints. The students should be upset about that. And I think that more than litigation it, uh, will be helpful. Are there, t are there times when we should not take action against it boycotts against Israel. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example that I, I think is written on this piece of paper, but it's a little hard to read. But I think this is what the person I was talking about. There's a, a website called Who Profits. I know Nitsana and Eugene know about this. We were actually contacted at Shureta Din by a date farmer who's being targeted by Who Profits. All of his employees are Palestinians. They go to each other's weddings. Um, they are, you know, the the epitome of coexistence and the reason, one of the reasons why BDS is so dangerous and uh, destructive. But my qu the question I think is, when do you know when you should fight and when you should not give them the credibility that they, that, you know, that we don't want to give them the credibility? How do you make that decision? I just want to jump in on that one, on who, because we um, have done a lot of work on who profits. Um, one thing that we've done is we put out a report Everyone cites to who profits, but no one actually looked at what they were saying and were their claims accurate. So when you see them quoted in some EU report, how, how do you even know if what they're saying is true? So we went through and systematically analyzed all of who profits claims. 
Um, when you actually look at their website, most of the information there is, is years out of date, anywhere from 10 to three years out of date. A lot of the information was inaccurate, and then a lot of the claims that they were making were completely off the wall or totally attenuated. So I think that's the first step, is to investigate what these people are saying and not take what they're saying at face value. That's step number one. Um, and then you can work to... Let me just say one thing. Who else profits should not who profits should not be confused with who else profits the Kohelet Forum's publication about business and occupied territories conducted by EU countries. They're very different things. We don't receive our EU funding for our report. It's entirely privately funded. Um, so I think it's a case by case assessment to answer the question. Every every case you have to look at possibilities of winning, the costs of winning, the incidental effects, are you gonna attract more attention to something or less? So every every case has to be analyzed, I think, uh, one at a time. Okay, I'll ask one last question, which is how do you or can you or do you have an impression of what the impact of the BDS movement is going to have on this college generation as they graduate and move into the workforce and into leadership uh, positions? I, didn't, I don't think the boycott campaign actually would be so effective for going forward, but uh, what I uh, where I do see a, a strategic challenge is really the different um, uh, concepts of international law and human rights that are being trying to be influenced uh, in uh, the academic uh, world and, uh, and the notion of kind of attaching Israel with the label of um, apartheid, which is, which is totally uh, absurd. So here I see a challenge, and I think first of all, one of our uh, efforts has to be to bring as many people as possible to Israel, because we have realized that there's nothing more effective to, uh, uh, on, on, on young people, on, 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 on actually on anyone, than, than visiting Israel uh, for his view of Israel. So we, we try as hard as we can, uh, other organizations do as well uh, through partnerships uh, with pro-Israel organizations with the Jewish world to bring as many people to Israel as possible uh, whether it's uh, in tourism but also in professional trips connecting professionals to their peers um, academics um, even uh, we have culinary tours we have uh, uh, all kinds of uh, events so, so this, this I think is, will be a game changer. We need kind of a birthright, but also for non-Jews. People need to come to Israel to have an experience, to meet Israelis, and this will have a, a large effect. Thank you so much, everybody. Please join me in thanking our panelists and our moderator. And, uh...